Mithin, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Likewise, Ashu, it's an absolute pleasure. It's been a long time since we connected, right? But, uh, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's fantastic uh, that, you know, uh, you know we, can, we could reconnect on a very, very exciting uh, discussion uh, today. Uh, you know, what have, uh, what, have, uh, what have you been doing off late, right? Being logged up, uh, how have things been? Well, Ashu, I can say I have managed to say as, as young as you look after 10 years, but uh, guess not. The age is already kind of showing up on my face. Uh, I'm still able to see my toes, if that kind of counts towards <laughs> uh, fitness. But, uh, you know, it's been a challenging year. I mean, despite all the humor, as you know, uh, I think uh, it's very unfortunate, the pandemic and the way it has played out. Right. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, the bright side, which we tend to look as an entrepreneur always is uh, that look, uh, the silver lining is, I mean, as we all know, uh, adversity builds character, right? And I think the adversity, what it has shown is the amount of support pouring in, especially from the private sector without having to wait for right. the government. I mean, as you know, I am back in country after almost 25 years in Valley. And right. one of the things back in those days, and now I'm dating myself, when I left the country, we used to always have this attitude about saying, oh, government... Right is not doing this, government is not doing that. What I saw this time, the difference in uh, in the first wave and most important, more importantly and more impactful in the second wave is the amount of uh, support that at a both private level and at a uh, you know, generally corporate level, public level that has poured in right, right. across the board. Uh, I work for a company where uh, we've converted a couple of floors of our office building uh, in, uh, in, in a city uh, into a oh. hospital. Yeah, we, we've gone all out in terms of supporting not just our employees, but their families. More importantly, we are trying to import some oxygen cylinders, which we did recently. We are bringing in more. And I'm sure ours is not the only company. There are a lot of, lots and lots of other companies, right? Both multinationals. In, yeah. I think, so, I think these, are, these are challenging times. Yeah. Exactly. So it's very heartwarming to see that right. I think, uh, the you know, uh, there used to be a probe we used to have in Europe when I did my second startup there, where we used to say, you know, never let a good crisis go waste. What I'm right. seeing now is that we are not letting this crisis go waste. Right. Uh, I sincerely feel like we'll be much better prepared, God forbid, if there is a third wave. You know, all of all of us uh, hope for that. You know, all of us hope for the best. Keeping fingers crossed. Uh, you know, uh, Mithin, before we dive into the, the discussion today, uh, you know, you've been you you've been an accomplished professional, right? Uh, somebody who's uh, you know really uh, seen businesses grow to a point uh, you know where they eventually got listed, right? And you've really seen that journey, right? And not just India, but you know uh, across the globe, right? Uh, you know, before we start our discussion today, right? I would love you to uh, take us through, you know, some of those uh, exciting parts of your uh, professional journey. Sure. Uh, Ashu, happy to. So I come from a very humble background here in Mumbai, just for, uh, you know, for the benefit of the audience. And, you know, one of those right. stories, early part of the stories where, uh, you know, back in 90s, uh, when you graduate out, there are not too many jobs, right? So you go abroad, do your education, get your visa. And, uh, so I'm one of those uh, stories where I tried uh, getting a job here, couldn't, uh, you know, exactly go out and say found something which was, uh, you know, kind of using best of my capabilities and abilities. I'm an undergrad in computer science. Uh, and then what I realized was uh, I wrote a business plan back then about creating uh, internet business, uh, which was more like collaboration in chat, which may sound very primitive right now, but back in early 90s, you know, it was a big thing. Uh, and I sent it out to a few companies in Valley through my, some of my contacts and they said, oh, this is, uh, you know, we are interested. This sounds interesting. Uh, we'd like to come over. It, back in Valley, those days, we didn't have Thai, which is the prim primary, the Indus entrepreneur, which is the primary, uh, I would say, you know, networking hub uh, uh, for all the Indus Valley, including largely Indians, but also the other Indus Valley uh, citizens, right, coming into uh, U.S. But uh, back then we had something called SIPA, so Society for Indian Professional Association. Uh, okay. and, and I managed to send this out to SIPA uh, right. using the early internet days, which is Veronica, Gopher, some of those tools that we used to use. And I got an interest back from uh, some of the entrepreneurs there and they said, oh, we would love to talk to you, right? Uh, you know, and, but I said, look, I'm based here in India. I would love to do something here. And I used to work for a company called UUNet at back time. UUNet was a Virginia company. They had an office in Hyderabad. Right. But long story short, you know, I managed to kind of go to U.S. to get my H-1 visa, went to U.S., uh, worked for a while because that's the Silicon Valley way of being an entrepreneur. You know, you don't, I mean, these days might be different, but back then you don't leave your job and start a company, right? It right. used to be always, the company used to be always like a weekend and, you know, moonlighting. And then until you go out and get funding and then you would go out and resign. Right. Uh, today you have Y Combinators and, you know, so many other accelerators which allow you to kind of go out and pursue your right. startup full time. But back then, you know, you had to bootstrap, as you said. So uh, was working at Qualcomm, 
uh, and, uh, and and did this uh, you know for two years and then when we got funded uh, finally came out built the company for another year and a half until we were acquired uh, by a very large company called infospace uh, right. we went public the stock hit all time high you know you had our, we had our highs and lows you have you know for the first time you're seeing actual wealth being uh, you know multiplied uh, as i said i came from a very humble background uh, right. and so you know you, you kind of learn along the way you make mistakes i did i had my share of mistakes too uh, but you learn along the way and you kind of understand that, you know, what is the end to end journey of a startup, right? This is, right. I'm talking late nineties when my first company was acquired. Sure. And then, uh, then I worked at Infospace. I ran uh, globally their business development for uh, partnerships. And this was the first and taste of how to run a global internet business. I'm talking 99, 2000, 2001, right. Right. 2002, I came out and I started a company called Mokondi in UK, in Europe. So I okay. moved, moved to London. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and I started this company. This was one of the early stage companies in 2002, 2003, which was doing content. We dabbled in a few things, frankly, and I'll be very honest here that we didn't have a very clear idea of what we want to do. We wanted a mobile storefront. We saw mobile content being hot. Right. Then the opportunity came in terms of three. There's a company called Hutchison Wampua in Hong Kong. We got the right. first 3G license in Europe. And they approached us for the first market event live was in Milan in Italy. And they said, right. hey, we would like to go live, uh, uh, you know, and we would like you to kind of go out and provide us the first 3G storefront. So worked right. on the 3G storefront. There were no 3G content available back then. So I had to work with a lot of publishers, a lot of game developers, especially in Europe and making sure game used to be hot as, you know, the killer app, as they say, right, right. on the mobile back in uh, those days. Uh, okay. Did that for a while. Uh, got The company got acquired. We had funding. We were based out of London. We got acquired by a company out of Norway, Oslo. Called mobile right. media so it was part of mobile media for a couple of years and then actually uh i ran into a, an old friend uh of mine uh who was a part of a company here in india called financial technologies and they were building right. out exchanges and i had huge interest in uh, seeing how the uh, technology part of the exchange works right so i kind right. of got uh, engaged on that front uh, became uh, uh, came on their board uh, also became an advisor on the technical side and right. then really helped in terms of setting up these financial markets what we call across the world, uh, including one in Singapore, uh, Indian Energy Exchange in Delhi, where I believe you and I first time met you know, probably eight or 10 years back. I don't recall, but I, right. I distinctly remember meeting you in one of the hotels in, right. so so it's still up and running as you know, in in, in Delhi yes. uh, and, and several others. We had about seven or eight. What actually lesson I learned is that for the first time I saw Indian IP being appreciated globally, Indian right. intellectual property, Indian technology, not services. We right. had Infosys, we had Wipro, we had a lot of those companies. But you know, a product company being a pure product company, let me put it this way. You had TCS right. and others who had services and product, but here was right. a company which was built end to end. Now today there are thousands of SaaS successful companies in Gurgaon, Delhi, Bangalore, right? We can name it. But right. I think one of the early guys who said, I can build a product company out of India was the founders of financial technology. And that was way back in mid nineties, right? And right. they had to wait almost a decade uh, to get a taste this kind of a global success, right? right? And it was appreciated by, you know, no less than NYSE, New York Stock right. Exchange, uh, and they invested in some of the exchanges like MCX, as you are aware, right? right? Uh, and then, you know, after that, uh, I've been uh, kind of going out. I've done another startup in Valley called Cloud Data. Uh, uh, that hasn't, uh, didn't turn out as well as I thought. We had uh, some couple of bad hires. Uh, we had to let go some of the people uh, here in India as well. Right. Uh, and then what I did was I said, okay, you know, I need to switch from entrepreneur mode back to, uh, you know, my technology mode. So you do that in Valley all the time. Right. You have, you know, setbacks, your failures, you get up and you start, you know, running yourself with your core skills. So right. I became consultant at Google and mm -hmm. then I helped basically go out and build them, roll out their ecosystem and community programs uh, as they were doing for Google Cloud right. and ran partnerships over there and basically build partnership across the, uh, across the world. Uh, also learn in terms of how to drive product adoption. So one of the key right. thing, you know, Google, I'm sure you're aware in 24 year of history, they have nine unicorns, right? So almost right. every two and a half, three years. And what you realize is they ship 400 products every year. You and I get to only see those four products which are successful. What right. people don't see right. is that there are other 395 products which didn't make it, right? So if you look at the typical Geoffrey Moore bell curve of crossing the chasm, and if you see how every there is a value of that and how majority of the product fall there. So you kind of learn how you go out and, you know, you know try to go out and create a, system where you can produce more unicorns right. in a lesser time with a lesser funding, right? So that was one of my key takeaways or learning working at Google. Came back and I'm now part of a company called Fractal uh, here in, uh, they're beta, uh, headquartered out of New York. Uh, they're right. based here in Mumbai too. Uh, found, actually founded here in Mumbai and then right. moved to New York. Uh, so yeah, so so that's where, that's a, you know, short version of or long version of if I may say, you know, the life journey over the last 25 years. 
you know i think i think there are there are few constants across everything that you've done right uh, you know there is uh, there is starting up uh, there is there's this entrepreneurial mindset uh, you know high growth phase and listing i think across all of and and uh, and acquisitions right i think all of, all of what you said right i think these are some constants that i can i can i can draw right uh no i think i think there are very few people uh, within who can really boast of a career uh, you know as expansive uh you know as you had and as as dynamic as you had right uh, and i think i think having operated across so many markets right it really brings in a very different kind of a sensibility right uh, yes. that are not a lot of professionals uh, uh you know can talk of right um, also the complex space right uh, sure. which are a key part of it uh, mithun i'm going to go into my first question right uh, sure. you know 2020 has been a very uh, you know uh, critical year right uh, it's possibly a year uh, you know we don't want to see again sure. uh, but what's also done is that uh, you know a lot of complexities that uh, for example uh, that were there in the india market and the global market right yes. it really sort of brought down the entire uh, economy or economies uh, to just about a few screens right uh, and uh, from being independent markets now these markets have become a larger homogeneous market right True. uh there are certain things that have changed forever right, right. Uh, what are some of your thoughts about it uh and uh, i i you know if you could give us a global perspective that'll that'll really help us uh, you know understand uh, you know the dynamics around sure. what is happening yeah sure so i think uh, first and foremost back in valley uh, where i spent majority of my time you know the sure. question that used to be asked is oh we are going to transform a industry transform that industry from a digital standpoint and the first question people would ask is when do you think are they leaders right. regards that question is off the table no more people are asking digital right. transformation is already happening across right. the board whether you're a pizza shop or whether you're a uh, you know a google or a general motor right. Right? right so i think i think one uh, you know constant that has emerged across the board is that digital transformation has accelerated in last two years as much as last 10 years right what would have right. taken typically a 10 years of normalcy uh, this uh, uh, pandemic crisis as a part of uh, you know uh, you could say side effect has actually gone out and help us right so that's very important for us now we can argue about the pros and cons across the industry but i think uh, uh, to a great degree we are seeing that industries and businesses have to uh, not just transform but innovate and they have to learn to kind of go out and innovate on on digitally and they have to go out and learn to challenge uh some of the uh you know new uh, uh, companies that are coming and challenging the right. incubants right, right. Uh, uh which is all good thing because you know that means that the startups which are challenging the incubants and are basically changing in to a certain degree also the uh you know the game right itself not just the uh, playing ground uh we are seeing that uh, you know that is forcing a lot of these in, uh, the large companies to kind of go out and start playing on their turf instead of the startups having to play on the turf of the fortune 500 company the fortune 500 companies are now coming back to startups and saying so what do we do where we can go out and compete for example with an abc company in an xyz sector which might be you know leveraging machine learning which might be le- leveraging uh, digital technologies or cloud much more better than others that's one second i think you will see across the board that the cost of doing startup right saas company especially enterprise saas companies uh in not just building the product out but also reaching out to the enterprise customers right. i think that barriers have significantly come down and they continue to reduce right if right. there was a job you know like a moore's law just like what right. we had for the chip if you basically apply a law which would say and i'm just making this up but let's say covid law starting 2020 or next 5 right. years we are going to go out and look back and say wow that's a profound amount of uh, impact Right. that these industries have gone through you know and impacted because of the startups that came in that place which would have never happened purely because a the barriers to entry were high and also the funding not available and the cost right. of going out and you know uh, b- building the startup out both on the product side and marketing side would have been significant right. uh, that i think uh, is a good news for the new generation right just the gen z right. uh, uh, because then when they are going out when we were doing startup way in early 90s mid 90s in valley Uh, right. i remember uh, you know we have to go out and ship a product within 2 years today right. uh, two years uh, you know is is a forever right i mean if you if any saas comes to and i am an angel investor and if anybody comes to me today and pitches me uh, and say i am going to take 2 years to go to market i'll go out and say buddy you know i don't know whether that industry is going to you know be around right, right? Okay. or it's going to look the same so right. so i think 2 years is a very long time i mean today to be today we are talking in terms of almost uh, cycles which are crunch 10x right? right so i think that's that's another uh, important parameter but that's this is all in my opinion good news if you are an entrepreneur starting out now which is the primary audience i would believe Uh, right. you know you would have for this uh, purpose and the third and the most important part is as you said you know all the global markets have collapsed and are available on zoom today right. i mean right. essentially you right. can actually go out and if you have a compelling content 
uh, in terms of uh, a value proposition for that industry. And if you set up right. a webinar or a set, set up a call, a Zoom call, they are going to be available. You don't need to go out, set up a meeting, show up over there. The expectations around the globe is not about that. Expectation is if you can deliver me value sitting in Timbuktu, I'm right. okay. I'm ready to go out and buy your digital products or service, whatever it is, right? right. Essentially. So I think if you look at that, the whole you know, as they say, the hardest part to change is the human behavior. So if you look at the human behavior, especially in the enterprise buying space, right, including right. consumer, but I think largely I would focus on enterprise because consumer, uh, you know, you're able to kind of go out and do a dipstick text, uh, you know, directly. Enterprise, right. what happens is, you know, you have to go out and sell. So, you know, there are influencers and there are buyers and then you have the end users, right? So you have a couple of layers before then you hit the end users. Consumer, right. you get to go out and hit the end user directly. So it was relatively easy, of course, on the digital front. But I think what you will see now, uh, what we are seeing now because of that is that the uh, behavior even on the IT uh, purchasing side is shifting from CTO, CIO, if you see to the line of business, right? So the marketing guys, yeah. So the line, so marketing people will go out and buy SaaS services that will basically empower them and make them decision faster or you know get to market better, faster, cheaper, right? Same right. way sales, same way human resource. CTO, CIO role has by and large come down to you know playing the governance, regulatory, uh, a role in terms of going right. out saying from a security infrastructure standpoint, and whether they are, yeah, you know. Right. Uh, so, so I'm not saying that uh, their role diminishes, but I feel that there is a complete gear shift in terms of what they were doing in terms of, uh, you know, people who used to have the IT budget, controlling IT right. budget, a large portion of your, today, I think that a significant portion of that is more to the line of business owners, right? Your VP sales, your VP marketing, your VP human resource, because all of these are seen Right. to be providing competitive edge in a new age organization, especially if right. you want to compete digitally. Uh, very interesting. Those are... Very interesting. And I think, I think, I think also, uh, you know, uh, I think risk is getting redefined, right? And I think, I think in the enterprise space that becomes very important, right? Which yes. is also my next question, uh, Mithen, right? I mean, you know, you, you're somebody who spent a very large amount of time, uh, you know, in building alliances, partnerships, right? Uh, you know, and scaling an organization, uh, with these channels, right? Uh, and these are channels which are, you know, often underrated, right? Uh, right. And and I think I think uh, you know a lot more credit needs to be given, right? You can actually build a very successful, profitable, sustainable enterprise by using some of these channels, right? Uh, but within the biggest of all challenges, you know, when you when you're talking to you know a, a founder, you're talking to a startup, or you're talking to, you know, when you're evaluating enterprise space in general, right? Uh, what essentially happens is that there is a long uh, it's a long sales cycle, right? There are a lot of stakeholders that are involved. Uh, the deal sizes are large, right? Um, and, uh, you know, there is this huge perceived risk, right? From an early stage startup to being able to deliver a strong, uh, consistent solution, right? Uh, is that entire effort worth the time, uh, you know, for for a founder, right? And like you said, you know, times are changing very, very fast, right? Two years is going to be a completely different requirement, right? When it comes to industry, right? So, do you think is that is that worth the time and effort for a founder uh, or a, or a product lead to to kind of uh, give? Uh, good, very good uh, points, Ashu, that you mentioned. My take on that is that if you have a domain expertise, if you spend five right. years in restaurant business or five years in a supply chain or five years in horizontal or vertical, right? And if you have the domain expertise and if you feel that there's a value that you can go out and either create or unlock right. by taking that uh, process or line of fun uh, business or function digital and collapsing, whether it is TAT turnaround time in terms of meeting customers, like uh, or basically going out and uh, you know reducing cost or creating new efficiencies or creating right. synergies by collapsing the supply chain. I believe this is the right time. Uh, and the reason is because unlike uh, in 80s and 90s where you have to be a very large company with XYZ balance sheet and you know n number of offices, et cetera, as right. I said, today you could be, I mean, I know companies out of Rajkot which are doing global businesses, right? right. I'm not kidding. Uh, I know, right. and I'm not naming even Pune and Hyderabad, but I'm looking at you know cities like Indore and uh, Rajkot and Baroda, right. and right. I and and of course, of course, the Gurgaon and Noida have always been there. I consider them anyway the TRA market. But today we see a lot of these uh, uh, you know companies which are coming out of these towns, and they are doing global businesses. And when I say global, you know, at a scale at fifty to hundred million dollar. Right. which would have been unheard of if you would have told me 10 years, 15 years back, right? Because they have a value proposition, they have a strategy, uh, they are addressing a problem which nobody else is, or uniquely at least, even if others are doing it. And more importantly, if I take the partnership, they know how to partner. I think one thing that 
uh, perhaps everybody could learn in the digital space is the increased need to collaborate and partner, but also the emphasis on how do you scale your revenue exponentially and non-linearly, right? right, by partnering. And that art of partnering is uh, perhaps, in my opinion, the single most learning people can have by looking at companies like Freshdesk, for instance. I'm just you know, using them as an example because that just comes out of uh, whether it is channel partnership in terms of putting distributors and dealers and uh, you know, consulting companies as a partners across the world, which they did. Or there are other companies like Sears, as I was mentioning, I think the founders out of uh, Rajkot with right. the operations in Pune, and then how they have singularly focused on partners like uh, Google. Uh, right. and, and, you know, build businesses around that. Because right. if you look at uh, 90s and 80s, there were businesses, multi-billion dollar businesses that got built around Oracle and Microsoft and SAP and PeopleSoft, if you recall that. Right. I think what we are seeing now is that there is an opportunity to build multi-billion dollar businesses around, uh, you know, all the cloud providers, whether it is Azure, whether it is Google, whether it is uh, AWS, and also some of the SaaS providers like Freshdesk, for instance, but also Salesforce and many others, right? right. If you are able to singularly focus and align your organization around that. That's the most important part. There are no shortcuts. I mean, which means you need to have a three-year commitment, a thousand day. You need right. to have your entire organization aligned with that partner, either at a field sales level or at a, and at a marketing level and at a partnership level and leadership right. level. Then I think there's a huge opportunity in my opinion, and this is what my experience at least has been, uh, that look, we will never be able to go out and hire enough salespeople. Even Google can't hire enough salespeople, right? right. I mean, Amazon has on Amazon AWS cloud alone some 10,000 salespeople, I mean, at least that's what I had heard. Right. And probably Google Cloud has the same number, but I don't think they can meet still enough demand or they can actually serve their customers profitably even by hiring, you know, an infinite number of sales guys right. on field, just from a theoretical standpoint, they will need right. to partner. And if you are one of those partners in any of the verticals or geographic, right? And if you're able to execute well focused, then I think there's a huge opportunity and value to be unlocked. Interesting. But then, uh, you, know, uh, you know, when you're talking about enterprise sales, right? Uh, I mean, there are there are two extremes, right? Uh, you know, and this this I think is true for India. Uh, Asia, I definitely believe it's true, and uh, and I think you can you know add to you know uh, some of the other markets uh, like say Europe that you've operated in and the US, right? Yeah. Uh, the two extremes are uh, you know an extreme where you have the SMBs, uh, and then the other extreme is where you have large business accounts, right? Enterprises, yeah. okay? uh, and the consumption appetite of these uh, businesses is completely different. Right? Uh, sure. So when you're talking about SMBs, you essentially have one or two people in the decision making uh, on the table, right? right. And when you talk about enterprise, you know there is, you know there are a lot of stakeholders that are involved, right? So you have the Correct. CFO's office involved, where you have to justify, you know, why are you buying this? Uh, you have the CIO, you know, who's sort of making that entire assessment, right? And uh, and working closely with the CFO there. And then of course you have the business uh, lead, uh, you know, who's taking the call, right? Do I want to build these kind of costs and all of that, right? Correct. How do you how do you navigate? amid these two extremes, right? Uh, and that's a very challenging thing. True. Uh, help us understand that. Please. Sure. What? So there is a famous slide uh, by Sequoia, by Y Combinator, which talks about for largely for digital SaaS company, which talks right. about and says, identify your product market fit. And in that, basically they show a graph and say, are you a rabbit? Are you a deer? Are you a lion or are you an elephant? And the reason okay. they are saying is the elephant markets are the fortune 500 and above, right? And right. and likewise, as you go, you have individual consumers who are like, let's say the markets for rabbits. Right. Now, depending on your product market fit, right? I mean, uh, essentially, if you look at how, uh, you know, you're trying to go out and distribute a existing market, like, you know, Freshdesk went after Salesforce, for example, and said, right. said that, look, we can actually serve profitably a customer with a, and I'm saying from a pricing set of $50 per user per uh, uh, per month, for instance, and they figured right. out a nation, they could each provide same product, same value proposition, which the customers validated and at a price point, which is a lot lesser, for instance. And right. they identified that there's a significant mid-sized market, which is waiting for a solution like this, who all have aspiration to go with Salesforce just because it's a market leader and out right. there. But they also are looking at a price point, which will allow them to go out and not exceed their budget, right? In terms of automating their business function, sales right. and marketing in this regard. So I think depending on the product market fit that you uh, fit that you see out there, uh, there is a significant market in each of these space. Uh, I would argue that uh, based on what your product value that a customer sees, right. uh, you may want to identify that first before you kind of address the market. I don't think any company has been successful going out and addressing into a market. Even when Salesforce started, I can tell you, uh, I remember 15 years back on 101 uh, in Silicon Valley, Salesforce used to have this uh, uh, billboard which talked about how software is dead. And they used to go out and, you know, uh, uh, so, you know, they used to talk about Siebel, 
Siebel right. was the CRM, as you know, and Salesforce went after Siebel Market. But initially, they did not went after the Fortune 500 thousand. They went after basically what we call the the fast adapters, right? Which is the tech companies right. who could not go out and wait. Uh, for a Siebel implementation to be completed in six months, nine months, you know, the enterprise software, how each used to be notoriously taking long period of time, right? So yeah. if you can identify your value proposition and the product market fit, and if you can go after that, I think then you can slowly scale, right? Either upward or downward, and you can identify and say, I'm going after individual market, or I'm going after the elephant, which is the Fortune 100, 500 market, right? Uh, I would argue that each of these strategies would be very different. Product fit would be different, pricing would be different, and I think distribution model in how you're serving those mod, uh, markets would be very different. At, geez, at Google, for instance, we realized at some point that serving uh, all customers below one million uh, is not something that we do very well. First of all, it's not profitable for sure, but it's something that we are not able to do very well because we are not able to manage at a relationship level individually those accounts. So we said anything below one million, we are going to go out and work through a partner, right? So you got to have a partner, even if the uh, in the lead is inbound and you right. would go and work with the partner, empower the partner as if almost they are in their sales force right. so that you're able to go out because tomorrow the same customer when they grow from a million dollar to let's say 10 million, right? right? That account when you have, you want to make sure that they are happy. So, right. you know, don't treat channel as I say, like your, uh, you know, uh, uh, the step brother, right? I mean, treat right. the channel and the sales and the partner as almost they are part of extended part of your team. Right. No, I think that's a very important point that you highlighted, right? And what I what I hear is that uh, I think depending on the product, depending on the value proposition, depending on the maturity of the market is essentially how you decide whether you want to build, you know, an internal stale sales strength or uh, or an enterprise team, or do you have to sort of uh, build a you know a channel partnership, right, uh, which helps you get to customers better, right? And like you said, uh, you know, possibly Freshdesk is a is a fantastic example that has come out of India, right? And that has cracked you know cracked the the SaaS space in a in an absolutely uh, phenomenal way. Uh, Nitin, uh, you know, my second part of that question was, sure. right, uh, and which I'll rephrase, uh, is, uh, you know, what is better, uh, a top-down or a, or a bottom-up, uh, you know, when, when you're creating for enterprise clients? Uh, you know, both, again, yeah, both. <laughs> right, yeah, so I think you probably guess the answer that I think it varies uh, entirely on the, on, the, on the product and the product value proposition, but I'm a firm believer, personally, right. my bias, right, if you all operate through our biases based on our experiences is to build something ground up because right. the more closer i'll give you an example uh my daughter runs a company which is uh, called 221b uh, right. they are at ai enabled at tech analytics right. uh it was, a, it was a huge humbling experience for me to see how she's building that software company so she's a master's in data science and ai from iit chicago but uh, instead of taking the route of saying i am going to build the platform or the software or the application first, she took the other way. She said, I'm going to personally go out, be an advisor or a counselor. So I'll tell you the problem they're solving is for high school students, how to improvise right. through a live dashboard, your A, GPA score during your high school, because that determines your college, your right. uh, competitive exam score, SAT, SAT, et cetera, your extracurricular, which is your research paper, internships, et cetera, whatever you do, or robotics, et cetera. And the fourth one is your college admissions, your right. college admissions, especially abroad, if you are looking, then you always have three bucket target, what we call reach uh, uh, and uh, and dream. So wow. basically, yeah. So reach is the bottom part where you say, I know for a fact that I'll get it. Uh, the target is the one which is aspiration and dream is really, oh, if I can make it to Stanford or MIT, awesome. You know, I really. Now their goal is to improve on all of these four. And she wanted to build a live dashboard because she felt the need herself that, uh, you know, and even my son who's in high school now, uh, that there is, you know, these guys are flying in dark in the sense they don't know that if I am in ninth grade and if I'm losing a mark in math or if I'm falling behind in math and science, and let's say if my target is MIT, how this is impacting four years down the line, my college admission, you know, right. or if I'm not doing anything in summer vacation, not doing an internship or a research paper, how it is going to impact my admission. And, and to a great degree, you can say your career also is impacted because you know where you are getting graduated and from uh, you know which stream you are getting graduated right also matters a lot when you're looking at job prospectors going forward or even if you're looking at startup it how a dropout is time for dropout still has a higher value than uh, uh, at doing a startup in terms of getting funding right, right. than somebody else so uh, unfortunately we do live in that bias age right as we said it, the biases are always going to be there the point is that she said, I'm going to first start counseling students. And based on that experience, I'm going to collate what we call first party data. And based on that data, I'm going to start building my 
uh, what we call UX, right? My wireframes, and then I'm going to show that to the students and say, is this something what you are, you know, looking for? So instead of going with her instincts that this is what I feel the product would be, she took the reverse approach, which is the ground up that you're mentioning, perhaps. Uh, I've seen enough, pro I've personally failed on, you know, a couple of my startup ideas purely because I thought, oh, I exactly know what the business problem is and I want to solve this because this is my way. So right. she did not let her biases come in the middle and she actually worked with about 20 odd students over the last right. one year. Right. And today right. when I see her dashboard and every time she talks to me, I feel like there's a lot I am learning. You know what I'm saying? In terms of understanding that what the user needs are versus what your, uh, uh, what your biases will lead you or your influences will lead you, it's totally different. And I, when, I, when I watch her go out and talk to her end users are students, of course, but also parents and teachers. And when I see her going out and learning from them all the time and absorbing and incorporating that, I feel perhaps that is one of the better ways of, you know, and you will see a lot of very successful entrepreneurs in the tech space are the one who actually have listened to the users, understood, build the product and continued building the product and refining the product based on the user feedback. I, I think, think that, we think, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think, I think, I think that's a, that's a, you know, there are some very interesting points that you highlight, right? Uh, I, you know, I will, the, the question that I asked, I'll come back again uh, to that question sure. a little later, right? But I think, I think what you said, uh, you know, about your daughter building, uh, you know, this product is absolutely fantastic, right? And I think what I hear you saying is that, you know, when you are building something, right, it's important to identify the stakeholder and build it in a partnership with the stakeholder, right? Uh, awesome. Building a silo is not something that is, uh, that is efficient, right? And, Very well said. Uh, and I think, I think that sort of also brings in a lot of preconceived, uh, you know, notions, which are not necessarily which might not necessarily be correct, right? So I correct. think evolve in the process is essentially what you're highlighting, right? It's Absolutely. Right I think right. I think the right way is the partnership, uh, you know, partnership with stakeholders. I like that phrase. I'm going to use it somewhere in Ashu. <laughs> uh, but then, uh, you know, on a lot of occasions, uh, you know, in, in fact, you know, I'm taking a question out of what you what you just said, right? Sure. On a lot of occasions, what happens is, uh, and you know, founders tend to come in this mistake, right? Uh, they, uh, you know, tend to build. Uh, you know, in a silo, right? Uh, you know, uh, in a, in a, an, in, under an impression that you know this is a solution that will go on to fit the requirement of a customer, right? Uh, you know, uh, and they also, for example, uh, you know, there is a preconceived mindset when it comes to pricing the product. Uh, you know, when it comes to you know kind of engagement that they anticipate and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and that is something that they communicate uh, in the process part, right? And and that could be completely off uh, target when it comes to uh, that customer, right? Uh, uh, you know, how important do you believe in an enterprise environment? Uh, is it important to build, I mean, have that element of flexibility saying that, listen, I am here. This is a solution that we've created. We want you to plug it in, right? Especially when you're an early stage startup, right? right. Uh, and and then get to a point saying that, you know, this is the relevance of what we're doing. And then sort of get to a point where you can price it right. And, you know, you have clarity in terms of how it's being used, engagement, so on and so forth, right? How important do you think that is uh, for this entire uh, you know, play to be uh, coherent, uh, cohesive, uh, you know, dependent, and uh, also give to the foundation strength? Um, excellent question. Um, I would argue that it becomes more important in enterprise space because uh, accessing enterprise users and tapping enterprises who would uh, share with you what problem they want to solve in white space in itself is a huge challenge, right? right. Unless, unless you are not a trusted uh, a partner or a trusted source or a trusted contact with them earlier where you right. probably know them, uh, they will be reluctant because of obviously the enterprise confidentiality environment right. going out and telling you, look, this is the challenge we have in our supply chain or in marketing or in sales, or we are losing customer year or attrition or, you know, finance, etc. Right. So I think once you have uh, a, what, and I'll borrow your phrase, uh, enterprise partner, stakeholder, right? right? Uh, right. In your, uh, uh, to validate your hypothesis that, look, there is a value to be created through efficiency, cost reduction, time to market, driving innovation, whatever that might be. Right. I think it becomes paramount uh, important that uh, you engage those stakeholders early as a POC, right? right? And say, look, I'm completely coming here with an open mind where our goal would be to solve this. These are some of the hypotheses I'm working along. I am ready to go out and play along in terms of creating a POC, which is you know, barely covering the cost or sometimes even you know, in many ways, funding the cost, right, through right. partners, right? Because today you can get a Google Cloud to go out and give you credits to build a PSC. Today you can go out and get, uh, you know, large other partners also who are happy to go out and be your partner in funding those uh, PSCs, right. right? Because they have vested interest in putting mm -hmm. their technology later on uh, into that. 
Uh, so when and if you can align those partner interests and if you can go out and co-fund that right. POC, I think enterprises today are a lot more open because you know previously there was you know you as you know we all move by the fear or greed. Uh, right. It used there used to be a greed that look if we go out and today there is a fear that if we are not automating fast enough, if we are not creating value, unlocking even at a enterprise functional level, right? If you're not doing that fast enough, I mean you know I'm going to be replaced. And I'm not just going to be replaced by another person. I might be replaced by a SaaS function. I better be part of that journey so that I'm able to kind of go out and stay ahead in terms of driving that innovation or, uh, you know, getting that SaaS services adapted and then, you know, building more innovation on top of it, working with the vendor or partner right. in this case, as you said, uh, then being left out, right? Uh, so I guess uh, to answer your question, I would argue that, uh, you know, having an enterprise partner, a stakeholder as a partner in early stage of your startup who right. can work with you in terms of POC until you have the POC validated internally by the user is a much better place to negotiate even on the pricing than to right. go up front and say, this is what I think. I think you can leave the pricing discussion out and say, hey, let's discuss this at the time when I know for a fact that we have helped you solve a problem. Right. And then whether this is a, you know, annuity business, whether this is where we can unlock value ongoing basis, there are multiple right. ways you can initiate right. those conversations. And I think enterprises today are comfortable to the extent they don't know the POC is at a fixed cost, right? right. A discounted or a fixed cost. I think that's a very important point that I highlighted. But Mithil, is that, is that uh, you know, sense of, uh, is that prioritization? Is that sense of, uh, you know, uh, losing out to a dynamic market? Uh, you know, uh, is that across the globe? Uh, you know, is that, uh, or is that a varying speed, right? So, for example, say the US and, and, and Americas is, is, is much faster when it comes to anticipation or require, anticipating a requirement of a certain, you know, a product or a tool. Uh, Europe would have a very different kind of an appetite. India, you know, because of the complexity and regionality that we have, right, could operate in a very different way, right? Uh, is that is that a global phenomenon right now, or uh, is that something which is uh, limited to? Uh, I mean, every geography has its own own uh, dynamics. Yeah, so I think very pertinent and very good question. As you rightly pointed out, every geography and every sector uh, right. has their own uh, uh, you know uh, dynamics which right. come into play. I would argue, based on my experience, and again, I'm influenced by my experience, that if you can think of US as the right. market where you are able to go out and fail fast or right. move faster or get the PUC going faster, the probability of you finding a customer in US who's willing to go out, share the risk right with you Right. Uh, is very high compared to others purely because it's a very open market. Uh, there's right. a global competition. Uh, as you know, US enterprises, they thrive on going out and building, you know, you know. and I'm not saying they're leaders in every technology space. A lot right. of places you will see Japan or China or even Europe ahead. But when it comes to adaption, I haven't seen the kind of premium a US enterprise places on uh, working with uh, or taking the risk of, you know, working with a startup, working with a new technology, working with a new product, uh, working with uh, a new approach, if I may say, I have seen them a lot more open, purely because, as I said, from a historic standpoint, if you look at India, you know, for instance, on the other side, we have just started opening over the last eight, 10 years. If you go back right. before that, I'm sure, you know, if you are not in IT budget on an annual basis in March or April, there's <laughs> no, yeah, no chance, even if you, you know, right. if you are attacked on a cyber uh, hack, right, you the only time you're going to go out and get funding. So, I, I mean, we are far away from those days, but the point I'm trying to make is we are still, I feel that every SaaS company today that we have in Bangalore to Gurgaon should look at US as the primary market because I know for a fact that if you have succeeded to a great degree, it becomes easier to sell into Europe or rest of the APAC markets. Right, very interesting. Uh, and I think I think US definitely has that uh, you know lead when it comes to uh, you know uh, technology leadership and you know all the products and adoption. Uh, uh, you know, Mithin, one one very very important question that I have right when you're designing and you're building for enterprise, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, there are, every enterprise is different, right? Uh, and it's a behemoth, right? It's, it's a very large uh, system that you're literally sort of dealing with, right? Uh, you're not dealing with a, uh, you know, with just a lot of few headcounts, right? Um, you know, there is an, there's a requirement of customization, right? Every single time that you implement, okay? Uh, now, there are two ways to look at it. Either you build for a very specific requirement, right? So that could be just, for example, say a simple piece that you are sort of either building it for, which just gets fit into the entire stack that you have, uh, or you are, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a platform play that you're building, right? Uh, and, and, uh, and through that, you're possibly trying to address customization and, and, and all of that, right? Uh, do you think, uh, uh, you know, having an angle of, uh, you know, solution sales, right? Which is consultative sales, right? 
uh, how important do you do you think uh, that is right uh, and you know how should you sort of say prioritize it if not say early sure. on uh, you know how do you sort of play that uh, through the relationship that you built with the enterprise sure i think it's it's an excellent question again i think uh, uh, i would based on my experience of having seen many consulting companies trying to build a product on the go while they worked on multiple project right. uh, uh, the tendency that you tend to kind of go out and say yes uh, to every ask from a customer uh, right. is very high number one right. uh, number two you tend not to build or support the channel as much as you would do because you feel like their consulting business is competing with you and your own turf and right. no matter how much you try to keep the church and state separate uh, you tend to kind of go out and favor your consulting versus other right, right. so that second third i think uh, it all comes down to focus right if fresh desk get try to for example i'm using that because most of the viewers would be familiar with fresh desk uh, right. we could talk about other products too but you know if they had gone out and tried consulting model i don't know how far they would have been successful because uh, essentially the idea is that you stick to your core platform and right. any and, and the way you define that when you do a poc is by going out and making sure that you are only signing up for on the sow on the things that you feel are core right so right. the as i say you be careful of what you ask for because chances are you will get it uh, right. so when we work on to large customers we our ability to say no plays a very important part right. in future shaping of our product the moment you go out and fall and say oh that's for instance and i'm making it up microsoft or google or or at&t or any large or coke coca cola right, right? Uh, our te- say oh how can we say no right we will have to go out and support i think to a great degree in 90s and early 2000 a lot of companies especially indian companies because you know again from a cultural standpoint we are not accustomed to going out and saying no to right. a client right? right but i think our ability to go out and say look mr customer i understand your sow what we will be able to do is to a justice to this part of sow and this is right. something where we want to focus and we want to build this for the rest right. others we will be happy to go out either if you have a partner or we can bring a partner to the table and they will be able to kind of go out and help you customize it implement it deploy it extend it now there are various means you know whether it is right. api or others by which you could go out and do that but i think that is super critical and i think that is the role of the founder because if the founder doesn't know how to say no right especially in the early stage of developing a product you tend to right. go out and build right uh, a truck meets a convertible kind of a thing mishmash <laughs> right right no i think that's uh, a very interesting point i think that's a very interesting point right i think i think the ability of a founder to say no and tactically sort of handle that entire thing is very very important right that brings me to my my next question right uh, is that you know there are certain visible right for example pricing is a visible you know uh, how do you plug it in is a visible you know how you're trying to sort of say uh, you know measure certain certain metrics or uh, you know their performance and improving the performance is is, is this thing right uh, there is a huge software side uh, within right uh, to selling to an enterprise uh, you know uh more often than not you know when startups are actually going out and selling to a lot of these businesses uh you know the one missing gap is that they don't realize uh you know the kind of uh, uh you know the so large enterprises are supposed to be uh complex. are complex right and they like you know there is this there's this uh, you know they're listed you know there is this a lot of this this you know cosmetic uh, side to it uh, you know but they have to manage certain things in the process and stuff like that right and a lot of decision making happens because of a lot of those things right uh you know what are some of those uh, you know some of those uh, you know points that uh, one should uh, understand uh, before they are out there to uh, tell to uh, you know an enterprise customer how how would you how would you, you know what would be this say those top three or four points that you would have right that one should sort of uh, be careful of careful when you're selling to an enterprise a oh, great question again uh, i would answer it more at a tactical level than strategic because i know right. we talk a lot of macro but at micro level the way i would go about it or we have i have seen successful many companies go about it is that there are no shortcuts you have right. to go out and engage them at a field level right. but before you engage them at a field level it is very important to do the homework for instance right. if you are going after an account uh, and if uh, uh, and if they are basically let's say broadcom and if you want to go out and sell them something on ai or ml base right. solution right uh, for their supply chain the first thing you would go out and do is study and say w- based on their website or press releases and other data based on linkedin post etc you will find out and say who are the partners that they trust today because right. if you don't have a trusted relationship in broadcom chances are that if you go in fresh new you will never be able to get into the door so right. what you're buying through partners is their trusted relationship that they have built over a period of years right. so it is very important to go out and then engage with the partner and say 
we have heard or seen through press release and website and case studies, et cetera, that you have delivered you know, ABC solution in the past in supply chain. We would like to understand more with you in terms of what your current relationship are, what are the challenges they are facing, and then validate with them and say, by the way, here's what our product does, and this is what we would, in the knowledge that you can get without even talking to a customer, by just speaking with that partner, right? Be it a SI company, a consulting company, could be a SaaS company, whoever the partners are. I think that is critical because what they give you is that inside knowledge of having already been there, done that. Second, what they get to you is once you sign them up as a partner is the trust that they have built. So if the partner takes you in and say, by the way, here's our partner, and they apparently have a very interesting idea or a product or a solution for a problem that we believe as a partner and you're brought on, right? That we believe that would be very interesting for you. And we would like to spend up a 45 minute Zoom call or a meeting. Right. Chances are you would probably give it to me then to the new guy, right? So you get a foot in the door, you're leveraging the trust they've built. Right. And chances are that if the value proposition is a good fit, even if it is not, you're going to learn a lot more. They'll be a lot more open with you because you came through a trusted source. So I think leveraging uh, that relationship, leveraging that trust is important. Leveraging the domain uh, is important, working with a partner. And the fourth thing I would go out and say is, you know, getting a good understanding of the partner. You you know, basically, whether it is compliance, whether it is risk, whether it is quarterly result, sensitivity around those, uh, competition, uh, which platforms do they work with? I think right. those homework are super critical. You may find that a lot of time partners do not have enough time. And the fact that somebody is already up to speed in terms of what their IT infrastructure or security infrastructure looks like, right? Basically goes out and makes them feel you they believe that, look, here's a vendor slash partner who would be a lot more easier to work with right. because of they are already being up to speed. And finally, I would say flexibility. You should be a good listener than a talker, right? Even if you're there to sell, Right. Uh, I mean, I, I, I know it sounds uh, uh, given that I'm doing most of the talking, but uh, hey, you gave me the job, right? Uh, but but the fact is that, look, uh, you know, you got to be more of a listener, at least in the first couple of meetings than a talker, right? And, right. and, and avoid, you know, bringing up the product, preferably in the first meeting, right? Or solution. And if I first try and understand very good, get a very good understanding of the problem. Right. To, those are the four, five key important parameters, right? Uh, right. to break into an account. Never try and go out. I mean, I know cold call have worked in the past with a lot of salespeople, so I'm not saying this is the only way. But I, in my opinion, right, the way to build trust faster and right. confidence faster is to actually buy into it through a partner. Right. Very interesting. Uh, then I have, uh, uh, you know, a, a product side question, right? Uh, because, you know, the most difficult part for any sales uh, person is to justify uh, and defend a bad product, right? Uh, unfortunately, you know, a lot of cases, I mean, in a consumer internet business, it's a, it's a different ballgame, right? Uh, product is also part of the sales process, right? But in an enterprise space, when you're when you're dealing with a B2B customer, you know, there are, uh, product tends to operate in a silo, right? Uh, and sales lands up eventually defending that entire thing, right? And then, of course, there's a very different kind of a friction that happens and there are leakages that happen in the system and so on and so forth, right? Uh, what do you think are certain product hygiene uh, factors that uh, you know founders should keep in mind uh, you know you've highlighted some of them already right sure. uh, uh, but you know what is it that they should keep in mind uh, besides say building a collaborative environment uh, or building in a collaborative environment right what are some of the other things that they should keep in mind sure sure one uh, key thing that i'm very big believer in and it's worked for me in the past is right. uh, building an ecosystem around your product okay now building a community and an ecosystem around your product is critical mm -hmm. to because of many reasons. One is essentially, you know, you're building a brand visibility, which is basically like a domino effect of afterglow, where right. you go out and say, these are the ecosystem partners we work with, right? So right. identify products or solutions that are going to sit around you, 360. Right. Sit mm -hmm. in front of you, sit behind you, sit beside you in a IT stack. Right. The fact that, for example, if I'm in supply chain and if I can go out and say that, look, I work on the back end with Oracle, for instance, on the right. database side, or if I'm going out and working with BigQuery on the cloud side, or the fact that I work with uh, 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 you know, uh, Dynamics on the, uh, on the dash dashboard and analytics side, all of these are going to help you when you go to a partner and say, here's the bouquet of ecosystem. I love the slide where it goes out and says, here's how our product sits in the your IT landscape. And by the way, eight out of 10 vendors that you have are already our partners and we have pre-integration with them. Because to me, that's a significant uh, efficiency and you know time to market, cost to market in innovation and headache that right. I'm solving for the buyer purchasing. Right. 
the headache of going out and saying whether this will really work and the fact that I'm able to. So I think investing in that ecosystem is critical. Investing in community is also important. Let me define community. So right. community is essentially where you say my users, my developers, my buyers are my community. So if I'm going to go out and talk about innovation in, let's say, machine learning, and if I have a forum of uh, CIOs, which talks about application, and I'm just making this up as we speak, but application of machine learning to go out and drive sales you know, innovation, for instance. Right. And if I can bring a lot of these uh, chief sales officer or chief revenue officer, as we call right. them, and we create a community and we bring and we provide and say how machine learning is going to enable them in terms of right. next generation selling in a given vertical. It could be CPGR, like a consumer product good, for instance. And if you bring them together and the kind of questions when you go out and ask them are either the business problem they are solving or your product is already solving, right? So right. building a community of your users is critical. And the community of buyers, like the chief revenue officers is right. critical. And at the end of the day, developers as well, because the more developers internally become your chief evangelist internally and talk about and say, this is a very robust product from an engineering technology, product support, documentation, video, tutorials, bug fixes, whatever it is, all right. of those standpoints, the better you look within an IT organization and the sign off comes from the IT side, right? right? So you have line of business, you have IT, and you got to go out and make sure that you have an ecosystem and community on both sides uh, right. that is going to go out and support your core product because then you're not in an island, you're not a silo, you're not a standalone. Right. Uh, and in fact, the entire community will vouch for it. If they go out and pick up a call, let's say, uh, you know, they work on with Google and they say, by the way, we heard about this product, which is on your marketplace and they claim they are your partners and how right. they're not going to say no, because obviously it drives more Google cloud billing, for instance, right? right? So it's a win-win situation and it provides a solution which is more out of box rather than some assembly required. Very interesting, and I think I think what also happens is, and I I'm, I think you know when you when you while you're talking, I'm in fact you know uh, you know visualizing that entire thing, the entire canvas in my mind, right? And I think also the fact that on a lot of occasions, possibly the client is not very comfortable, you know, giving you a lot of insight, right? And given that you have this ecosystem around you, right, like like you sort of spoke of, right, will give you a lot of insights in terms of how do you design that product for that client, and I think beyond, right? Uh, right. And that's really important. And I, I really buy the community point that you. Uh, you know, you've highlighted uh, in the process. Um, I, have one, one, I have just one additional point sorry. in community. Sorry, just to make sure. Oh, please. The final phase of any sales process is customer reference, usually. Right. And when you want to go out and give a customer reference, that's where the right. community within CPGR, if you cultivated them well. Right. So example in CPGR, let's say you are a, uh, and I'm just making this up, you're an Nike and you want to talk to somebody Right. Uh, uh, you know, uh, at another uh, famous uh, shoe brand, Adidas or anyone, Puma, and or even in the similar space, in the consumer space, the right. fact that you cultivated that community through, you know, quarterly community meetings or monthly meetings, talking about right. challenges, they're facing innovation, they're, it's helping you not only build your better product, integrate your or get drive by faster adoption within your customer, but also in terms of that uh, influencer or buyer going out and becoming part of your core stakeholders so that when you give them as a reference to the other guys, they are, will be the first guy and say, look, you know, while their product is great, trust me, there were a couple of things, because, you know, you're not just going to ask for good reference. You're going to go out and say, tell me two things that their product hasn't delivered. Tell me two things that the company doesn't stand. At That's the time when they are going to go out and say, look, you know, we did have a failure. The implementation doesn't, but guess what? There has been one thing consistent about this company is that they stand by the product. Right. They made sure that it not overcharges. They told us if this was the budget, they did it within that budget or within the time frame, gave extra resources, gave extra, whatever that, what, whatever right. it takes to keep the customer happy. Now that kind of a reference is very hard to buy without not having a community. So I just Absolutely. wanted to highlight. That is, that is, you know, such a significant point that you highlight, right? That adds to the credibility of the organization, you know, and, and an early stage business, you know, that is essentially what you want, right? A customer True. logging you at that level, right? Like, like, yes. highlight, right? Uh, within, uh, you know, more often than not, uh, on a lot of occasions, feedback is a big problem, right? So what are a lot of factors that you highlighted are external factors, right? Yes. It's about the ecosystem that you create, right? Uh, but on a lot of occasions, enterprises fail, right? Or, or uh, you know, uh, companies or, or startups that are designing for an enterprise customer, right? Uh, tend to fade out because the feedback system is inconsistent, right? Uh, you know, one, how important do you think a feedback system in an environment like that is? Second, what could be the process uh, that, you know, early stage company, even a, a mid-stage company can sort of have, right? Uh, so that, uh, you know, they know that, uh, you know, uh, how do they need to sort of uh, you know, chart their path for future? Uh, and what is their customer? How is their customer evolving? Sure. I think excellent question. Uh, 
I'll tell you one of the early projects I did at Google uh, right. it was uh, man, my manager gave me it was uh, you know creating FAS F A right. feedback as a service. Right. And part of the reason is you know when you have four hundred products when you let's say Google and you have four hundred products right and you have more than four hundred million users or subscribers to different right. of these products right and I'm just giving some uh, abstract numbers these are not real numbers for right. obvious reason but. How do you go out capture feedback in a systematic way using technology uh, platform so that uh, you are able to collect that data, process that data, uh, harmonize that data, do analytics real time, and also take action based right. on that data so that your next engineering version cycle incorporates the feedback that might come out, right? And wow. how do you identify the value out of data? Because not all feedback would be valuable. Right. Second, how do you remove biases? Because you know, a lot of time when a feedback comes from somebody who's from MIT or who's your large customer who's paying you, or who's the guy next door sitting to you, or who's a friend who's of you know whom you think is a whiz kid, right. you'll tend to put more value to those than to the feedback coming from, let's say, some uh, obscure town in India or China. But it might be equally valuable. It's just that right. you're not able to see from their lens, right? But maybe very perceptive and maybe valuable. So how do we take care of biases? How do we take care of influences? How do we make it transparent, fair? Uh, open. One of the ways uh, I've always proposed is adoption of blockchain, but I understand that this forum is not about technology because, you know, blockchain kind of solves uh, some of those issues and we'll maybe at some other forum talk about that, how a decentralized uh, environment which creates trust in a trustless environment, right? That's how I, so blockchain is like an elephant with seven blind men, right? Everybody's describing different part of elephant. They're all right, but collectively. Right. So my definition as one of the blind men is that it's a decentralized platform that builds trust in a trustless environment, right? That's right. what you want to do. You want, do not want biases, but you want also want the trust in the transaction. Right. Uh, coming back uh, and answering on the feedback, it's a, it's a very massive opportunity, very big opportunity. None of the companies have figured out a way to do this at what we call now these day and age scale. Right. Data at scale, machine learning at scale. So feedback at scale is a massive challenge. And then unlocking value and mining or mining intelligence out of it is another issue. One is how do you collect that, right? Because one of the ways that uh, companies, uh, digital SaaS companies are doing that, which is very good, but I think it just addresses one aspect is that when you are on that product page, even if you go today on Google Cloud and you'll see right. on the right hand side, even Microsoft does that, AWS does that. on the right side, uh, there is also a pop up that comes up and says, you know, how do you find the product? How do you, and it's a small, short Google form kind of an application and allows, but there is no reward, there's no recognition, but it just tries to go out and capture at a very high level. I don't think it's a perfect solution, but to answer your question, it's a good start. I do believe there are going to be many, many companies that already exist in the feedback space, but who are going to go out and try and address this issue in a very uh, uh, cohesive way to you know, borrow your phrase and in a 360 manner, which will actually go out and gives product managers an insight in terms of saying, if I have to take this product and make it successful in the Middle East, how do I ensure uh, you know, for instance, uh, you know, that I'm taking care of the nuances in terms of culture, language, because I may mean something, say something, all of those. And I'm taking this from a real life example. I don't want to name the product, but that oh. happened during my time. And it was a hundreds of millions of dollars of waste of marketing, product marketing effort that a company had to incur purely because, yeah, the Arabic support uh, uh, was, uh, was not thought through. Uh, let me put it that way. Right. The feedback was given already, but by the time the feedback cycle came back, which is feedback collected, processed, given back to engineering, the product was already shipped. The point I'm trying to make is a lot of these, uh, I think efficiencies uh, and problems can be solved uh, if feedback at scale can be addressed, right? And, and can be addressed 360. Uh, right. Today, the only means we have is, as I told you, that right side button we have, which kind of drops out and gives, you know, home. Right. one of the startup ideas, and we can talk about this later that I had was rewarding, recognizing uh, feedback based on the value of their contribution in the overall product. Right. And that value is uh, in a cryptocurrency. It doesn't need to be Bitcoin, but it could be. And it is actually a percentage of the profit that the product version creates. So every time there's a product improvisation where I contribute. So you could be in a perfect utopian world. You could be sitting in some remote village in China. You contributed and that contribution is recognized by the community, not by the product manager. Right. In a surfaced, you know, through community votes and community feedback. And if that gets incorporated, if the product does X, you know, a certain percentage of that is kept as a uh, as a prize money, as a, as a as a token, 
in right. crypto and then that gets rewarded back because you know in a perfect european economy especially in a pandemic times like this you don't want to be oh the only way i'll make it is if i'm in silicon valley or oh, the only way i make it if i'm from mit the only right. way i'll make it if it, i'm in google i think those barriers are the next barriers to be and i think blockchain will help anyway then then you know i think i think you know what you said right in terms of incentivization of a product manager basis of feedback you know yesterday i was in a conversation i was talking to uh, you know co-founder and technology head of a a very large uh, uh, you know startup which is doing phenomenally well right okay. uh, from a cash flow perspective you know we were talking right and this is actually what he said he said that you know we have devised a mechanics uh, you know to incentivize our product teams uh, you know in terms of how do they identify opportunities based on feedback and then you know reengineer them or engineer them and you know and and sort of uh, you know I build see. that as a feature and extension to the product that they're offering and stuff like that right and i was like i i said you know this is the first time that i've i've heard that i'm sure yeah, there yeah. are other other companies that are that are doing this uh at least in my you know whatever conversations that i've had uh, this was the first right and i said i said this is fantastic right absolutely uh, you can really break it down and like you said right incentivizing them in form of say a bitcoin or whatever right yeah. um i think that just uh you know you're building a very strong foundation for future right exactly uh, then you're rewarding your product managers to listen to their end users better by saying that look a percentage of uh you know how just how product managers get rewarded themselves rewarded in of the percentage of bonus or whatever i mean you're now going out and rewarding the users who are actually the contributors and based on the worth of the value right it's right. it's determining the worth of the value of their contribution somebody's worth could be less versus more we will talk about that maybe on a separate session again uh you know one of the most difficult parts uh we towards the end of a conversation one of the most difficult parts uh is that you know when you are a founder right you right. essentially enter you know building a product with infinite belief right uh, and you know in an enterprise environment uh, on the other side you know you have uh, you know a bunch of uh, professionals you know who are who are operating in the present right uh, and there are very few uh, you know uh, very few who, who stand out right in terms of you know wanting to be in a position where they want to uh, decode the future right uh, in an environment like that it becomes very difficult for a founder to go out and and convince right uh, uh you know you've highlighted a lot of mechanics in terms of what one should do and you know and, and joint collaboration and stuff like that right how important and this is off the side of my question right how important is persistence when you're out there to sell uh in an in, in an enterprise environment to an enterprise customer um, uh, again an outstanding question and i'm hoping a lot of value here in your questions itself ashu and uh, you make me think as well i mean i go back to an uh, Uh, uh anecdote that just happened in our home i was sitting with my son and i was saying i don't see the kind of buying from you on one of the project that he's working which is uh, called ureshi happiness in japanese it's an app for mental wellness okay. and i said that look uh, somewhere i feel like you know you lack and he says no i'm giving my 100% and i said look uh, the way i define 100% is that you have to be pregnant with that idea right so in an enterprise <laughs> right i mean you can't be going out and you know uh, without right. if you're not being pregnant with it then you know there's no you can't be half pregnant as they say right. so basically in an enterprise what we tend to do is find a guy who's pregnant with that problem right. so who's actually facing a specific problem or who may face a problem for future because when you're pitching you know make and and, and and at that time the level uh, or the title doesn't really matter he could be a developer it could be a system analyst could be a data analyst could be a shop right. floor guy but i think the fact that he's the one living breathing eating sleeping the problem uh, every day he will have a lot more better appreciation he will be your first evangelist i'm not saying right. he's the only one but he will become your first evangelist right, right. so it, it's very biblical but like uh, you know i was just where, where, where i'm watching the movie mary bagdell and i saw how jesus christ went about recruiting some of his early followers right. and it was amazing to go out and see that some of those early followers had actually nothing to do with they just happened to be the guys who uh, had Uh, the specific issue in that time with the romans and 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 year was jesus christ offering a solution and i'm no more you know an expert i just want to make sure right. but my key takeaway right my key takeaway from that is that look he was able to identify earlier peter john paul all of these guys who had specific problems and who found uh, salvation or solution in what jesus offered at that time lord jesus offered at that right. time so the point i'm trying to make is i think it's very important if you look at these early followers you i'm telling you i would have bet you know x number of dollars if somebody would have told me if i was alive back then that look you know christianity will become so huge and jesus christ as a you know lord will savior will become so right. huge because the early followers if you look at you'll say i mean i don't know where this religion is going to go with just three right. four guys hanging around him right? right the point i'm going to make is that a lot of these uh, times entrepreneurs lose hope because they think oh i'm right. not talking to a vp or a director oh i don't have a buy in from the finance guy guess what right. if you're solving the problem for the right guy it will eventually you know you have to have enough faith 
And that's really where, you know, difference is men versus boys, right? And when it comes to entrepreneurship, right? You got to go out and have that steel now to go out and believe that, look, I hope I'm making sense. <laughs> you did. You did. I think, I think what you highlighted is fantastic, right? Within, what, how important is it to have a good mentor, uh, you know, when you're nav- navigating through such, uh, you know, uh, difficult, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, clients and, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, you know, requirements, right? How important is it to have an advisor, you know, advisor, a bunch of advisors and a mentor, you know, who can help you at a personal level and at a professional level. I mean, I know you've been doing a lot of mentoring, right? Uh, And that's essentially what I asked you, right? So so I would say on the mentor-mentee relationship, you can, you know, you can you can bring your horse to water, but you can't make it drink. You know you can you you know uh, the mammoth has to go to the mountain. Mountain's not going to come to mammoth. So you right. know how receptive you are to mentoring. And again, I'm not saying you have to be hundred percent receptive. A lot of people may not require. A lot of entrepreneurs may not require mentoring. For instance, right. you know in many cases, and they have been successful as well. And there are many examples of those even in Valley. So I think it all depends on which mindset you're operating. If you are somebody who's saying. I absolutely value a guy who has spent 25 years in uh, CPG branding. And if I'm going in terms of retailing a next set of, uh, I'm making a brand of tea that I'm going to go out and distribute, right? Right. And I do need to, because I don't understand these nuances, these factors. And and, and again, a lot of that mentoring should not be only, and I say only quoted, only for connections or industry purpose, right? It should right. not be only for opening, helping opening doors. Right. A lot of time, mentors are only leveraged or only seen as a mentor if they help you open doors. Right. My opinion, I think any mentor, who, yeah. Please go ahead. Sorry, sorry. sorry my no, I was just saying that in my opinion, uh, a mentor role is 360, right? Right from product feedback to individual feedback. He's like your personal coach. He's like your doctor. He's also your advisor. He's also giving you advice on the right team, the right product, the right product market fit pricing and also opening doors. But what happens is, right, majority of the time entrepreneurs mistake mentors as somebody who's just going to help them open doors or help them raise funding. Especially in India, I've seen the tendency is, oh, if you can help me raise funding, you're my advisor. If you can help me open doors, you're my mentor, right? Right. Uh, That definition to me is highly skewed, uh, in many ways, incorrect. I'm I'm sure you understand. No, no, I completely agree. In fact, you know, and, and, you know, I I so agree with you. Unfortunately, you know, what's what it's become is it's become very transactional, right? Um, and I think what people don't understand is that you need a lot of that experience. Also, the fact that there is a senior professional, uh, you know, who's who's helping you, I think he or she is bringing a lot of their credibility on the line, right? right. Unless you are prepared to deliver consistently, right? It will be very difficult for him to put his reputation that he or she has built for such a long time to 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 sort of uh, to compromise that, right? And, right. and put it on the line, right? So I think there's a, there's a lot of work that founders need to do. And I completely agree with that, right? Uh, before they can get transactional, right? And I think, unfortunately, a lot of founders don't understand that it's a very shallow relationship that they are looking for. It's a very transactional relationship that they uh, you know, expect, right? Uh, which is not the right way. I think, I think good startups, what I've seen, I have met a lot of founders. I've known a lot of founders are founders who carry their mentors uh, for, uh, you know, not just opening doors, but like you said, right? The entire stack right it comes to you know the product mm-hmm. building product to building market to building us. team to building company Everything. exactly Absolutely. i agree all of that, right? so i i completely resonate what you're saying right and i think it's so much more important to look at it from a from a deeper standpoint uh, right. and i think what you have to buy is that is that you know that mind right. more than the relations right i think relations happen right uh, exactly so uh me then uh i'm towards my last question uh sure. second last question what sure. are some of the technologies that you've been, you are excited about, uh, given that, uh, you know, you've been investing as well. Um, you know, you, uh, on, on the other hand, are, are a very, very, you know, uh, seasoned professional who's operating with a lot of large clients uh, and interacting with them day in, day out, uh, and a lot of other stakeholders. Uh, you know, what are some of the technologies that you've been, uh, or you are excited about uh, that you think are going to make a mark uh, in the next uh, few years? Sure. Uh, you know, I would... Uh... Uh, say that, uh, you know, I would probably go out and borrow a phrase, which is a Zen thing, right? There's a story which says that, uh, you know, somebody goes to Lord Buddha and says, you know, show me the, uh, you know, path to success. And he says, you know, simple formula for success. And he says, simple, you know, when you see an opportunity, jump. And he says, okay, the problem is when do I, and he said, keep jumping, right? Right. So 
I, I do believe from an entrepreneur standpoint that when you see an opportunity, uh, whether it is machine learning, whether it is blockchain, from a technology standpoint, that is going to disrupt a particular industry, right. jump in it, try and see where you can apply it to solve the problem. For instance, personally speaking, I'm more very excited about leveraging machine learning at scale or data at scale to solve some of our healthcare problem, life science problem, right. supply chain. If you look at our country, right, our massive amount of opportunity lies over there consumer behavior because india is as we know country of countries right as we all know so so i think you know uh, if leverage right machine learning a lot of innovation can come because access to data is available see access to technology is always was always there is across the world right. but access to large set of data what you need to train machine learning right and diverse data velocity of data volume of data all available here in india Right. And available in various sectors, whether it is CPG, right. whether it is retail, whether it is healthcare, life science, whether it is telecom, right. media, your ability to go out and find a niche, right. learning from that data, leveraging that data and finding a solution, whether it is enterprise or consumer, to right. me, is the single most biggest opportunity that you you know you have and it requires marrying technology with a vertical domain expertise so if i'm a tech guy i would love to tie up with somebody who's from x sony or xz or x hotstar or x disney and right. say what problem can we solve how do we get access to the data right etc right to me you know, india has that you know fantastic advantage which i'm hoping I'm, and i'm sure i'm seeing a lot of SaaS companies would go out and leverage because your machine learning models coming out of india are going to be a lot better trained because of the variety like of data, data, velocity of data, exactly, volume of data that is available to train those models, right? Sorry. Because as you all know, AI and ML are only, you know, as good as your data, junk in, junk out, right? If you're Sorry. going to go out and, uh, you know, as I kept saying, a machine learning model that look, anything which has got two feet and moving, uh, or, or, you know, and, and you're going to go out and start labeling each of these data incorrectly, right? right. For instance. So, so that's one. Second, I think blockchain. I think our country, we see processes and, and, and you know, still not very inefficient. Also, uh, from a global market standpoint, right? I believe that India and other countries who were behind for various reasons, or let's say we're, we're, we're not uh, play, we're played out unfair hand, if I may uh, right. put it, because of the early investment in technology by Western worlds and you know keeping that technology away. Today, blockchain can change all of that, right? If you can right. go out and leverage that, right, to build, inject transparency, right, and inject trust in a trustless environment, you can actually build a global supply chain across right. any vertical, and we can go into a lot more detail around that, and you can actually go out and uh, uh, as you know, I mean, so right. NFT, for instance, right? I mean, right. massive way NFTs can be used in India where we can go out. So that's another very, very big, uh, again, NFTs are built on blockchain. So it's part of blockchain, but I think right. very important because anything that can be valued, which is uh, abstract and can be valued and can be verified that look, right. this is a, a true value. I think in India has a lot of those, right? Whether right. it is art, whether it is museum, whether it is temple, whether it is idols, whether it is statues, whether it is old well, I think, you know, the world we are going to, I mean, 20 years down the line, the digital world we are going to live in, if you have a blockchain digital certificate, uh, you know, you're going to be a lot more valued than not having one. It's like, you know, birth right. certificate, right? Having one, a digital certificate versus not having like a pan card. So I think, you know, we are going to see opportunities over there. And, the, and I think lastly, cloud, right? In general, I think, uh, there are adaption at the enterprise level, but I, I think even at an individual level, if everybody can go out and get accustomed to, just like how we got onto internet early and we right. reaped benefit, I think if we can jump onto cloud, I mean, we are not early anyways, but I'm just saying it's very important that there is a national uh, you know, agenda, which is driving cloud, machine learning, and blockchain, these technologies. And lastly, I would say security. Cybersecurity is going to be, we have all seen what has happened over right. the last few days in US, right? With the kind of, I think we are going to see increasing number of these cases, right? And it is going to create increasing amount of unstable world. The fact that, and look, India, the reason it has a distinct advantage, I'm specifically making this about India because largely right. your audience being from India. If you look at, if you are a US or any Western country, whom are you going to trust? Right. A cyber uh, a security software coming out of Russia, coming out of China, right? Uh, you know, or if you are Arab, then let's say coming out of Israel or coming out of India. So India right. has what I call the advantage of being the Switzerland for providing cyber security solutions right. to the world, right. because you're going to more trust a cyber security software coming out of India, arguably than China or arguably than Russia, if right. you're a US, right? And Right. And if you're an Arab, arguably more India than Israel, for instance, or if you are other way around, if you're Israel, more coming out of India than Arab. So I believe, and especially Europe, when I say US and Europe combined, right? So I believe there's an interesting, and the other reason is because India has massive amount of people who can be skilled because cyber 
uh, security is something that is not going to be one time, right? Every day you need to be going out and evolving and learning. And India has massive amount of that resources available where we are able to go out and learn, adapt, and implement in our cybersecurity uh, cloud-based SaaS services, right? More so uh, because of the scale of the country we have and the amount of attacks that we are going to go out and see being an important economy. So right. number of those factors come in, right? The scale comes in, the economic importance comes in, the neutrality of being a Switzerland in the cyber or digital space right. comes in. Anyway, so those are some of the reasons. These are some of the sectors I am excited about. I think I think phenomenal. Within, I think uh, this is, uh, I think I think the depth and the perspective that you bring is, is so amazing, right? And I particularly like that uh, you know that angle of uh, you know India being a very neutral uh, country and and I think I think uh, you know the dependability that we can offer right as a, as right. a country I really like that point and I think that could have only come from you given that you know you've operated in, in so many geographies it could only have come from you yes. uh, you know Mithen, uh, I you know I, I love your passion and energy around blockchain right uh, and I think I think this is something that you mentioned across our conversation right. Sure. You know, you have particularly spent time on on trade exchanges, right? Uh, yes. You know, you built it for India, you built it for uh, you know for yeah. global markets, right? I would love to pick it up with you in some of our upcoming sessions, right? Where we discuss trade and blockchain, right? And I am a I'm a big enthusiast of of this. Uh, I think I think all of us uh, continue to to sort of uh, uh, still sort of kind of imagine how it's going to play out. Yeah. Uh, there are some use cases. I think it's still early days. Uh, mm. But I think I think a discussion around you know trade and democratization and blockchain empowerment I think is going to be and the transparency right? I think it's just so much more interesting. Uh, Miren, my last question to you is uh, you know your 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 advice a quick advice for founders who are building for enterprise space. I know you've given a lot of that sure. in the course, uh, but one thing which you think is should be a constant right while you're building for enterprise or two things like right? uh, so, that you think are important. Happy to. I think one area we all need to, and I'm working on it too, which we need to focus on, which will be immense value, right, right. of currency, right. Uh, is going to be digital trust. Okay. Whether it is cybersecurity, whether it is blockchain, if you look at, basically, when we're talking cybersecurity and what we're talking India as a, with what we're talking is the digital trust that the nations right. would have on us, same way at an individual level. I think the digital trust as a currency for me as an individual uh, that he, you know, uh, whether it is my second digital avatar or whether it is uh, me coming up in terms of going out and talking about building digital businesses or SaaS businesses, right. trust is going to become a paramount and important role. And that's going to be a rare rest of the rare currency. Right. If we can all be cautiously building towards that. Part of the reason, as I said, that China will never be, a, for example, uh, or a Russia, a cybersecurity leader or in transaction where the currency is trusted upon is purely because of the perception. Right. Digitally, it has about a lot of these attacks emanating, whether it is true or false, doesn't really matter, but the perception is that emanating from some of these countries, right? So I think preserving our digital trust as a currency in all of our transactions, be it enterprise or consumer, is going to be uh, significantly important. So be careful of what we are sharing, whether it is WhatsApp on social media, be careful of how we are going out and providing SaaS services to enterprise or even to consumer, and also managing your digital avatar or your digital profile, which is right now summation of, you know, whether it is LinkedIn, Facebook, WhatsApp, all of that put together, but also otherwise. To right. me, uh, that is going to become over the next five years, right? Very critical. People are going to perceive you People who may not have met Ashu would have a perception about Ashu just because how Ashu's YouTube videos or his sure. blogs or you know what I'm saying, right? right. And, and that perception is going to carry them and say, you know, Ashu's really somebody who's passionate about entrepreneurship, startups around technology space, for right. example, if right. I may use this, right? right. Oh, and I think that is that is critical. The moment Ashu goes out and you know, kind of deviates, assuming from that in terms of going out and give some kind of a political commentary or some other religious or other, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think we all have to be careful about that digital avatar, whether consciously or subconsciously we are uh, being projected, we are projecting ourselves in a certain right. way. And I think if we can be, you know, cognizant about that, we will be able to build that trust relation. Right. And the fact that after 10 years, you thought of me because you had a certain perception about the relationship we build. Right. And, though we haven't met for 10 years, right? right? So I think this transaction in particularly, or this communication in particularly is a, uh, uh, is a good example of that. Right. I would, I would say that probably is one of the key takeaways. I think, I think, uh, you know, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, you know, the way I've always appreciated, you know, the perspective that you've been, uh, you know, you've been able to sort of uh, bring and highlight and, uh, and I think, I think, uh, you know, there's just so much more, uh, clarity in in uh, the way you put it across right uh, 
it's always amazing to talk to you thank you so much for taking the time out uh, yeah. you know this was one of the best conversation that i've had uh, thank you and, likewise like i said you know it's always uh, a pleasure to talk to you yeah pleasure is also mine my friend and also i got a lot to learn from some of the question they were very perceptive made me think hard and i'm going to share that back with not just myself but also my kids so i'll ashu thank you again appreciate thank you, the man. opportunity bye bye, bye.